Immediate certainty does not take over the truth, for its truth is the universal. Whereas certainty wants to apprehend the this. Perception, on the other hand, takes what is present to it as a universal. Just as universality is its principle in general, the immediately self-differentiating moments within perception are universal. I is a universal, and the object is a universal. That principle has arisen for us, and therefore the way we take in perception is no longer something that just happens to us like sense certainty. On the contrary, it is logically necessitated. With the appearance of the principle, the two moments which in their appearing merely occur also come into being. One being the movement of pointing out or the act of perceiving. The other being the same movement as a simple event or the object perceived. In essence, the object is the same as the movement. The movement is the unfolding and differentiation of the two moments, and the object is the apprehended togetherness of the moments. For us, or in itself, the universal as principle is the essence of perception, and in contrast to this abstraction, both the moments distinguished, that which perceives and that which is perceived, are the unessential. But in fact, because both are themselves the universal or the essence, both are essential. Yet, since they are related to each other as opposites, only one can be the essential moment in the relation, and the distinction of essential and unessential moment must be shared between them. One of them, the object, defined as the simple entity, is the essence, regardless of whether it is perceived or not. But the act of perceiving as a movement is the unessential moment, the unstable factor which can as well be as not be. With paragraph 111, we're entering a brand new section of Hegel's phenomenology. We have spent quite a bit of time now exploring the preface and the introduction, and then we got into the first part of consciousness, and we began, naturally enough, with what might appear to be most truthful, most immediate, most easy to take for granted, some sort of foundation point upon which we could you know, begin everything else, and that was sense certainty. Now we're transitioning from sense certainty into something a bit more complex, but also something, as it turns out, within the Hegelian point of view, something a bit more real, something a bit closer to the way in which we relate ourselves to, to things, to our perceptions, to each other, to the, the world that we share in perception. And as I put it out in the section just previous to this, in the video for that one, Hegel is going to play off of the fact that in German, um, perception, this is the, the, the substantive for it, where we're talking about the activity, Wahrnehmung, but it can also be Wahrnehmen, the verb, right? And this Nehmung, or Nehmen, means uh, a variety of things, but they all have to do with taking. They all have to do with, with gripping, with grabbing, with, with holding on to something. The var has to do with the true, or truth. So in perception, we are grasping the truth, or in other terms, the essence of what's there in front of us. We're not yet turning it on ourselves and becoming self-conscious. That's going to come about later on. Although there is going to be plenty of interplay here, where as we're looking at this important stage of consciousness, this gestalt, we're going to see that we are going to pay attention to the subject as well as the object of perception. So as we start this, he says, immediate certainty does not take over the truth. This is something that we've realized. For the truth is what? The universal. That was one of the hard-won achievements of the previous section, realizing that we're never grasping something just as it is. We're always bringing it under, you might say, the rubric or the aspect of some sort of universal. And we explored what a universal is. Uh, Hegel has a very interesting way of describing it in terms of being a negation of all of its moments, and yet it's identical with its moments. There's, there's a lot more to it that could be said there. But we've already explored that. So he says, certainty wants to apprehend the this. The truth is the universal. Certainty wants to apprehend the this. How do we bring those two together? 
How do we bring together the particular, what appears to be immediate, and the mediation that's going on within the universal? So he says, perception, on the other hand, takes what is present to it as a universal. Perception is, is working in a different way. So with perception, we have a subject who is doing the perceiving. We have this act of perception, as we'll see in a moment. And what is being perceived is being perceived as a universal piece of chalk, right? I don't just, I can have sense certainty of this as being white and, you know, certain hardness and certain sound to it. We could do all this whole exercise and all these qualities. But when I'm perceiving it, I'm perceiving it as piece of chalk. You're perceiving it in a somewhat different way than I am, but you're perceiving it as piece of chalk as well. You don't know that this is actually chalk, do you? I do because I'm holding it in my hands. This could in fact be a, a pencil eraser that I put liquid paper on to make it look white and I just wanted to fool you. That's also something that's going to come up in this discussion as well. With perception, we also become interested in the possibility of deception as, as well. But that's going to come in later paragraphs. Let's go back to this. So we have the object being grasped as the universal. So he says, just as university, universality is its principle in general, the immediately self-differentiating moments within perception are universal. Okay, so that, what does all that verbiage mean? That means that when we're looking at something like this, we can say a piece of chalk. We can also say pieces of chalk, right? And these are moments within the universal piece of chalk, or white cylindrical thing, or th something to write on the blackboard with, or things in Dr. Sadler's hands. It doesn't necessarily matter what universal we're talking about. We can bring a unity to disparate things by, by putting them all under one universal. So he says, that principle has arisen for us, and therefore the way we take in perception is no longer something that just happens to us like sense certainty. Now this is an important point. It's really easy to pass over this as you're reading through this because you're tempted to like get to the end of the paragraph, figure out what he's saying, but this is one that's very important to linger over for just a moment. What is Hegel actually getting at in saying this? The principle has arisen for us. What is a principle? A principle is something that is universal. A principle is something that the Greeks called an arche, something that's a beginning, something that determines other things, that provides us with a conception that we can then apply in other cases. So he says, it, therefore the way we take in perception is no longer something that just happens to us like sense certainty. What's going on here is something that has more logical determinateness, something that we can say has its own internal necessity. It's not purely contingent, like I happen to be walking around and taking in this and taking in that. There's something much more important, something much more intelligible going on. So what is that? He says, with the emergence of the principle, the two moments, we're talking about the object, the universal is one of these moments, and the perceiving I as another moment, Two moments uh, which in their appearing merely occur also come into being. That is, they attain a kind of status, a kind of reality that they didn't have, or at least wasn't apparent in them before. So he says, one being the movement of pointing out or the act of perceiving, the other being the same movement as a simple event or the object perceived. So what we have here, from the perceiving I, the perceiving I is what it is. It has its being through a kind of agency. It is a perceiver insofar as it is doing perception, right? And the object of the universal doesn't just sit there like a lump, unless it happens to be a lump, of course. It is an event. It involves a kind of movement that is involved in being perceived. This is not something purely static that is just being approached by the active subject. There's an interplay between the two of them. So he says, um, in essence, the object is the same as the movement. The movement is the unfolding and differentiation of the two moments. What are the two moments? This universal here, this universal there. Now, as he goes on, we're going to be posed with a really interesting question. Where's the essence? Where is 
the, you might say, the real show, what we're really after here, what's most essential in this process. And Hegel is going to pose to us a couple different possibilities. Maybe neither one of these is really essential. Maybe they're both essential. Maybe just one of them is, but in that case, which one is it? So let's look at each of these in turn. He says, um, for us, or in itself, the universalist principle is the essence of perception. And in contrast to this abstraction, both the moments distinguished, that which perceives and that which is perceived, are the unessential. So that's a little strange, isn't it? Let's go back over that one more time. What he's saying is, yes, there's a universal here and there's a universal here. And both of them are universals, which means they have something in common. So neither one of them effectively captures what's really going on there. At first we'd be tempted to say, well, we're, we have like a, a, a surplus of universals. We got one over here, we got one over here, this is an essence, that's an essence. But what's going on here is we're losing our hold on what, it, what it has being. There is something more. There's something surplus here. So this is the, the process of, of negation that's going on. He says, the universalist principle is the essence of perception. In contrast to this, both the moments are the unessential. But in fact, because both are themselves the universal or the essence, both are essential. So what is it? How do we resolve this? We have A and not A at the same time. Which is it going to be? So he says, since they are related to each other as opposites, we have to make a choice. Only one of them can be the essential element. Now, when we were looking at sense certainty and we had to deal with this sort of thing, where is the real essence? We generally put it on the side of the object, right? That which is imposing itself upon our consciousness, that, that's what consciousness is taking in. Instead, over here, we're going to say with perception, at least at the very beginning of it, that the perceiving I is what is most universal. The perceiver, not the perceived. The perceiver is doing the same sort of perceiving no matter what content we're dealing with over here. So that's a very promising beginning point, isn't it? He says one of them, the object must be defined as simple entity, simple being, some, something that is. Is the essence regardless of whether it's perceived or not, but the act of perceiving as a movement then becomes the unessential moment. So we have another dynamic shift here, and we're going to lose our grasp on what is really essential, and we're going to waver back and forth and back and forth throughout the rest of this section. So we had the universal taking it away, we go here, and now we come back over here once again. He says, the act of perceiving is the unessential moment, the unstable factor, which can as well be as not be. So let's think about what's going on here. Over here we have being in itself. It is whether there's a perceiver to perceive it or not. Or at least we think so at this point. Over here we have the perceiver. There's no perception if there isn't a perceiver to do the action of perceiving. And yet it's contingent whether there's going to be a perceiver. So that's what we're, what we're going to begin with. That's our starting point for this section. This object must now be defined more precisely and the definition must be developed briefly from the result that has been reached. The more detailed development does not belong here. Since the principle of the object, the universal, is in its simplicity a mediated universal, the object must express this its nature in its own self. This it does by showing itself to be the thing with many properties. The wealth of sense knowledge belongs to perception, not to immediate certainty, for which it was only the source of instances. For only perception contains negation, that is, difference or manifoldness within its own essence. Paragraph 112 is very short, and there's not a lot going on there, but what is going on is something 
that we do want to talk a little bit about because it's going to show us where we're going in just a few more paragraphs. So he begins by talking about the object, and he's reminding us once again that the object has been revealed as a universal, right? And he says we're going to define it more precisely, and the definition must be developed briefly from the result that has been reached. So we're, we're summing things up at this point, trying to get our head around where we've been so far. So he says the principle of the object, the universal, is in its simplicity a mediated universal. That means that the self of the object is going to have to contain that mediacy. And by this point in, in the study, whenever you see the term mediacy, you should be thinking, aha, we're moving ahead with something. Things are not going to be in a couple paragraphs what they are right now. But you should also be thinking a couple other terms, like you should be thinking negation. You should be thinking how things are connected with each other. Here, Hegel is going to figure it in terms of difference and multiplicity, or as the translation here has uh, manifoldness, uh, manifaltigkeit. You know, it can be, it'd be translated as either way, multiplicity or manifoldness. And we're going to move from the object to the thing. Um, I suppose it's good to know that he's talking about the ding, you know, that, that has certain resonances because Kant had said, well, we can never really get to the thing in itself. And Hegel is going to, you know, go beyond that. Uh, this has all sorts of other connotations that Hegel doesn't himself uh, necessarily intend, but later people are going to pick up on and run with, you know, the meaning of the thing. But, you know, so if we just stick with thing, that's fine, the English, you know, um, cognitivist. And what's really important here is that we're, we're looking at the object as the thing with many qualities or many properties, Eigenschaften. He's going to do a play on words with the Eigen, uh, dealing with that in a little bit. And when we talk about something having properties, again, think about this piece of chalk. What properties does it have? It has hardness, right? It has a certain durability. It has a certain taste. I'm not going to taste it right now because I know what chalk tastes like. It's white. It's uh, chalky, you know, if we want to be circular about it. Um, and it fits in my hand in a certain way. It's very dry. It's actually drier than most dry things because it makes my hands dry as well. Those are properties. Those are the ways in which we know the thing. And in a certain sense, these properties are themselves universals, but they're being perceived, they're being grasped through sense knowledge. That's what the richness of sense knowledge provides us with. When we look at a thing, we see its properties. We take those properties in. Uh, it's not for nothing that the ancients often thought of us sort of taking in, in some sort of uh, you know, metaphorical way, the thing itself into ourselves and grasping it, its properties within our, our soul or our mind. Now, Hegel is going to stress, he's just mentioning it here, but this is going to play a very important role, that these properties are marked by difference and multiplicity among themselves. And we'll just leave off with that because we're going to see how this plays out. But the key thing here is that perception or knowledge through the senses is taking place by moving to look at the thing which has many properties. The this is therefore established as not this or as something superseded and hence not as nothing but as a determinate nothing, the nothing of a content, that is of the this. Consequently, the sense element is still present, but not in the way it was supposed to be in the position of immediate certainty, not as the singular item that is meant, but as a universal, or as that which will be defined as a property. Supersession exhibits its true twofold meaning, which we have seen in the negative. It is at once a negating and a preserving. Our nothing, as the nothing of the this, preserves its immediacy and is itself sensuous, but it is a universal immediacy. Being, however, is a universal in virtue of its having mediation or the negative within it. When it expresses this in its immediacy, it is a differentiated, determinate property. As a result, many such properties are established simultaneously, one being the negative of another. 
Since they are expressed in the simplicity of the universal, these determinacies, which are properties, strictly speaking, only through the addition of a further determination, are related only to themselves. They are indifferent to one another. Each is on its own and free from the others. But the simple self-identical universality is itself in turn distinct and free from these determinate properties it has. It is pure relating of self to self, or the medium in which all these determinacies are, and in which as a simple unity they therefore interpenetrate, but without coming into contact with one another. For it is precisely through participating in this universality that they exist indifferently on their own account. This abstract universal medium, which can be called simply thinghood or pure essence, is nothing else than what here and now have proved themselves to be. That is, a simple togetherness of a plurality. But the many are, in their determinateness, simple universals themselves. This salt is a simple here, and at the same time, manifold. It is white and also tart also cubical in shape of a specific gravity, and so forth. All these many properties are in a simple, single simple here, in which therefore they interpenetrate. None has a different here from the others, but each is everywhere in the same here in which the others are. And at the same time, without being separated by different here's, they do not affect each other in this interpenetration. The whiteness does not affect the cubical shape, and neither affects the tart taste. On the contrary, since each is itself a simple relating of self to self, it leaves the others alone and is connected with them only by the indifferent also. This also is thus the pure universal itself, or the medium, the thinghood which holds them together in this way. There's a lot going on in paragraph 113, and you might see it as something almost like a labyrinth that you need an Ariadne's thread to make your way through. But what we're going to see is that a lot of what he's talking about here turns out to be fairly straightforward so long as we just take it one step at a time. So let's, let's do that. Let's look at what he's talking about first. So the, the book that we're using, the translation, uses uh, supersession as Aufhebung in, in the German. And we've seen that Aufhebung is, or Aufheben in the, in the verbal uh, uh, cognate of, of the term, is used to describe this process of negating, but also preserving at the same time that he, he's talking about in this section. And it's when dialectical progress takes place that there's some sort of Aufhebung. Not necessarily from one entire stage of consciousness to another, but also uh, it, it describes the process of movement within the stage of consciousness as it develops. So, he begins by talking about this kind of general schema. We begin with a this, and we negate it, so we get a not this, and then the question is, is that not this a nothing, or is it something else? Is it a not nothing? It's not a pure nothing. Instead, it's a determinate nothing. And that determinate nothing refers back to the this because it's a nothingness of the this. That was there in the this the whole time, just sort of waiting to be brought to light, waiting to be made determinate. Now, what? why is he talking about that at this point? Why is he just, you know, jumping into all this metaphysical stuff? Well, because it has something to do with, with our perception. So we began with the sense element, as he calls it, and we began with it in certainty. We treated it as of this. I'm there. Uh, what's present impinges itself upon my consciousness. I take it in. And as it turned out, it's not quite so simple as that. We found that ultimately the truth of sense certainty lay in the universal, that the singular which was being meant, which was being intended whenever we said the word this, turned out to be, in certain respects, unutterable, unsayable in language, and because language and thought are connected together, in a certain way even unthinkable. And the universal became where the, the weight, the gravity, moved to. And now we're seeing that we're moving uh, to further understand this, to make it more concrete, we're understanding it in terms of the property. 
the universal immediacy, as Hegel's going to call it. So let's, let's actually look at that little characterization that he has. He says, um, Our nothing, as the nothing of the this, the this that was over here, preserves its immediacy and is itself sensuous. So when we're perceiving something, when we're engaging in perception of a property, it's not that we're no longer using our senses. It's not a purely intellectual activity. We are still using our senses, but we perceive the property in the thing. I perceive the whiteness in the chalk. Now, you might say, oh, wait a second, Hegel, Dr. Sadler, all you're really seeing are light waves coming from that. And in a certain sense, that's what modern science teaches us. Um, but if you actually want to do an, a phenomenological analysis of what consciousness is like, our consciousness reaches out into the world of things. And it, it, per, it perceives the properties. There's something more than just light waves going on, there is an active uh, role that we're playing in constituting that, as, as the phenomenologist would say. So it's, it's universal, because it's grasping the universal, but it's grasping it in immediacy or in sensibility. Now, Hegel's not going to stay there for very long. Anytime you see the word immediacy, figure that we're not done yet, right? So he goes on, and he says that when we look at a property more closely, what do we find out? Its immediacy is a differentiated, determinate property. And what does that mean? Well, here's where we need to do a little bit of erasing, just to get us ready. When you differentiate, what's going on? If I'm going to differentiate, say, white chalk from blackboard, we have two things, don't we? Or I say, I'm a human being, this is just a tool for my use. Or I'm a human being and you're another human being. We're differentiating. We're splitting things into a multiplicity. And when we do that in terms of properties, in fact, let me get rid of even this, because we're not going to need that right now. We have a differentiated, determinate property of some sort. Now what it means for that to be differentiated is it has to be differentiated against another property or multiple properties. We can differentiate in multiple ways. We can say the chalk is white, it is also not black, it is also not red, it is dry, it is not wet. We're differentiating that way, right? We're also making it more determinate that way, but we can also differentiate within the perception of the piece of chalk. We can say it is white and it also is hard and it also is cylindrical and it also is pointed and it also, you see how we're doing that there? We're describing a thing in terms of its properties. So he goes on and he says, as a result, many such properties are established simultaneously. It doesn't matter which one we originally begin with. The chalk could be white, it could be hard, it could be, you know, tasting funny, it could be dry. It doesn't matter which one we actually start with because all the properties are there simultaneously, that is, within the same experience, within the same time. He goes on and he says, um, one of them is the negative of another. Since they're expressed in the simplicity of the universal, these determinacies, which are properties, strictly speaking, only through the addition of a further determination, are related only to themselves. They are indifferent mm -hmm. to each other. Now, you know, we could put more properties on the board. I'm going to keep it simple. Just keep it at three, right? So they're originally indifferent to each other. The white doesn't care that the, the white is there in something that's also hard. The hard doesn't care as far as being hard about the whiteness that's there. They don't, they don't care about each other, so, so far as they care. We're doing a little anthropomorphizing here. So he says, um, these determinacies are indifferent to one, one another. Each is on its own and free from the others. So we have, you know, we're going to use the chalk here. We have, say, whiteness. Whiteness is what it is. It's here. We sense it. 
but it's just by itself. Hardness. Um, dryness. You don't actually need to know anything about whiteness in order to understand what dryness is, or at least to perceive it through your senses, right? Now, things get more interesting when we say, well, yeah, but don't we have a piece of chalk here? Well, yes, we do. So we need to go on. He says, the simple self-identical universality is, is itself in turn distinct and free from these determinate properties it has. It's a pure relating of self to self or the medium in which all these properties are and in which as a simple unity they therefore interpenetrate. They are able to be there with each other. They are able to interconnect. They are able to be part of one experience. But without coming into contact with one another, for it is precisely through participating in this that they exist indifferently on their own account. So what is this medium? What is holding everything together? What is providing them the locus in which this can take place? That's a trick question. That's going to lead us in a couple different directions. What's the first one that we would think of? This, this abstract universal medium, which can be called simply thinghood or pure essence. Is nothing else than what here and now have proved themselves to be, a simple togetherness of a plurality. We have a plurality, a multiplicity. And we have something here that's, you know, a, a universal. It's bringing them all together within some determinate thing. In this case, the thinghood happens to be a piece of chalk. In another case, it could be a cup of coffee. In another case, it could be this blue uh, glasses cleaner fabric, right? We can pick anything that we want. And we can talk about this in general ways because we're not just thinking about you know, this property and that property and that property. We're thinking about the ways properties and things relate themselves to each other in general. And he's right. You know, these properties are, to a certain degree, independent of each other. And only, the only thing that allows them to interpenetrate is this medium. So he says, um, the many are in their determinateness simple universals themselves. So we have a universal here, right? And each of these properties is also a universal. So this is really quite extraordinary, isn't it? We have like a whole bag of universals and they're all connected with each other. And we have a universal that's able to take in other universals. And what this means is we're able to describe the process. We're able to use language which works with, with universals in order to make sense of this. We're able to think this. We're not just stuck going, oh, 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 you know, and making gestures and sounds that intend something. We're able to communicate with each other. We're able to do this to such a degree that I can describe to you something that you've not yet experienced by taking building blocks and putting them together and you constructing them into some sort of thing in your imagination. We do this all the time. So he says, um, the many are in their determined as simple universals themselves. He uses the example of salt. So let's actually follow through with salt. The salt is a simple here and at the same time manifold. The salt is white and also tart or salty, right? It is uh, also cubical in shape of a certain specific gravity. All these many properties are in a single universal here, in which therefore they interpenetrate. They're able to interconnect with each other. Not in themselves, not in what they are in themselves as universals, but as moments within this greater unity that we ourselves grasp. He says, um, none has a different here from the others, but each is everywhere in the same here in which the others are. The piece of chalk is white throughout. It's hard throughout. It's chalky throughout. The salt is the same way. At the same time, without being separated by different here's, they do not affect each other in their interpenetrations. Insofar as I'm writing on the board and you see something white here, what's the qualities that actually are being perceived by you? The whiteness, 
Also, I suppose you could say the ductibility, the malleability of the chalk as well. But the fact that it's dry, you don't care about that, and neither does the chalkboard. N certainly not what you're getting through this camera. There are certain properties that are able to do what they do independently of each other, depending on the context. They're able to do that because they interpenetrate within this here that is the thing. So he says, um, at the same time, without being separated, they don't affect each other. The whiteness does not affect the cubicle shape, neither affects the tart taste. On the contrary, since each is itself a simple relating of self to self, each of them involves this circular relation to self. Each of them is a complex whole because it is a universal. It leaves the others alone and is connected with them only by the indifferent... Also, this is white and also dry and also hard. Or if we're talking about salt, this is white and also salty and also cubicle. We could multiply these properties as, as uh, much as we want. The same sort of dynamic would hold. He says this also is also a pure universal itself. Or the medium, the thinghood, which holds them together in this way. So what does it mean for something to be a thing? Let's pause here for a moment. For something to be a thing means that it introduces this also into the manifold of its properties, and it allows them to interpenetrate with each other, and also to be radically distinct from one another. That's what a universal does when we're thinking about many pieces of chalk. But now we're thinking about how universals work within sensible particulars that we are grasping under universals. 